The death of a child is a devastating trauma for any family. That it will provoke a mother to pray for another baby to replace the one she lost is not all that surprising. But what is it to be that new child? Gail Gallant spent a lifetime struggling with that and takes us through it in her new book. It's called The Changeling, a memoir of my death and rebirth, my haunted childhood, and my education in sainthood and sin. And Gail Gallant joins us now. It's such a pleasure to meet you. You too. Beautiful, beautiful book. Thank you. Um, so you were born about a year after a tragic accident uh, devastated your family. What happened? Well, my parents came up to Toronto from Prince Edward Island where they were born and raised, but every summer they packed up the car and went back down for their summer vacation to Prince Edward Island to visit family and friends. And this was a few years into their marriage and they had three little girls with them this summer that they had uh, set out on their, on their annual visit. Um, the three little girls, uh, um, Linda, Glenna, and a little baby named Gail, she was four months at the time, and they, uh, on their drive down toward the end of the first day driving, were involved in a head-on collision, a, a horrible crash. And um, as a consequence of that, it took, uh, it, it, it was long drawn out, but as a consequence of that, the baby, Gail, died. You paint this uh, picture in the book where, because your parents are also injured in this accident, mm -hmm. um, and they're trying to be by their daughter's side, um, and we actually have a photo of your parents after the accident. Mm. Um, and it was taken during Gail's, uh, Gail's funeral with your mm. parents and two sisters. Mm. Uh, when did you first begin to understand the story of how you were born, of your birth? Well, it's just among my earliest memories. So however, you know, when in my mind, I must have been about in three years old or so when I first remember clearly my mother recounting the story to me and what was important about it was that she she presented it as though I wasn't simply a substitute for the baby that died. I was that same baby. My mother was devoutly religious um, and had been raised to believe in miracles and the power of prayer. And uh, she was devoutly religious. She also was overcome with such kind of mad grief, I would say. Um, and prayed so fervently. She was um, convinced when she became pregnant within a couple of months of losing that baby that that same baby was coming back to her. So um, she believed that, and, and nine months later I was born, I was identical. I weighed the same exactly. And on top of that, she had no labor pain mm -hmm. during my delivery. It was interesting that the same pounds and ounces yeah. are the same. Yeah. And so she gave you Gail's name? Yes. Yeah. I think in my simplistic child brain, um, certainly she thought I was the uh, she was I had been reborn as a, a, in, in answer to her prayers, uh, and I certainly believed it too because uh, you know. You wrote, um, I began to wonder if I had been born again in order to fulfill some divine purpose. <laughs> Can you explain that feeling? Mm. You know, I think. In the, in the earliest days of, or, or years, I think I just reveled in my mother's love and in this f blessed feeling that I had been brought back from the dead for my mother and that I was, this had happened to me and how special is that? And I think it wasn't until I was probably five or six years old that I started to become a little anxious that perhaps there were strings attached and I think it was uh, probably watching uh, the song of Bernadette on television. It was a, a very Catholic family, and so and so the song of Bernadette about a, a child who's uh, the, the Blessed Virgin Mary appears to her, and um, when when the Blessed Virgin Mary appears to somebody, it seems, and they become a saint, and usually their life goes downhill from the outside. Anyways, that's how it looks. And uh, it, I became very anxious, and I, I, I got it in my head quite fairly early mm -hmm. that I was probably, uh, had been brought back in order to um, do, do something special. To, I had to do something, to because I knew that babies died all around the world and weren't brought back from, to, to life. So you were so unique. why was yeah so why was I brought back to life and I I felt I think I st I felt 
uh, I don't want to say at that point unworthy, but I, it was just that the just the beginnings of self doubt. If I was in fact the other Gail, she died um, at five months old, you know, and in my Catholic imagination, she would have died perfect, innocent, the true object of my mother's love, an angel. Um, and so uh, the strings attached was I, I had to, my life had to be continuous with that. I had to be that, if, if I was going to be that same person, that I had to try to figure out how to be perfect. And to be sin. without sin. Yeah. <laughs> as a person, which yeah. is, you know. Here's a photo of your first communion. Um, <laughs> it's on the screen. Uh, your mother's uh, devout Catholicism mm -hmm. played a big role in your early life. Mm. What was that like for you? In, in our house, back in the late 50s, early 60s, it was saturated with Catholicism. In a, a, I, I, you know, uh, religious, um, you know, blood statues and pictures and we had rosaries, we had holy water fonts in the bedrooms. We, and, and, and then of course we went to mass every Sunday and it was candles and incense and statues mm. and, you know, prayers and all. Um, it was a magical world. I mean, I, it was a, a world filled with imaginary, I don't want to say imaginary people, that's loaded, but I, what I mean to say is um, invisible world of angels and saints and, and you know, God and Jesus and, and the Holy Ghost and, and the Virgin Mary. And it, it felt, you know, in a child's imagination, this Catholicism for me was, it was a very rich and... Uh, amazing experience that although of course it had this always had a dark side you know you had the stations of the cross wrapped around the the walls of the interior of the church with Jesus basically being kind of being slowly tortured you know and abused and hanging from the cross in a you know in in a, in a little you know loincloth thing so there's strange kinds of uh, dark side and then, um, and I'm assuming and, as you get older you start to question this other dark side because as a child, yeah. maybe it is like you said, it's magical. Mm. Um, how did your relationship with Catholicism change as you became older? Yeah. Um, it took a while because first, because I was a, a fervent believer and, you know, I prayed fervently. I, I, when I was like 12 years old, I was riding my bike to daily mass on in the summer. And I, and I had already told my mother I was going to be a nun and I, you know, I fully embraced um, my religion. And I think what ha things came to a bit of a, you know, the initial crash was just turning 13 and suddenly, I mean, and you could say I was even a little late, you were discovering boys. Mm. Um, the stumbling block was, was uh, sex, I'm afraid, because, mm. and this is, you know, part of being Catholic, you know, there, there was a strong prohibition against you know, premarital, for instance, sex. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, when I first discovered boys, I, my relationship with my mother suddenly took this kind of nasty turn. I realized how much that bothered her that I would start to be, you know, as the 13 year old girls are like, boy, crazy. Mm -hmm. And then, or at least some of them. And then when I was 16, I had my first boyfriend and then things really crashed. And I think that combined with this growing sense of the, when the the role of women in the church, mm -hmm. these things started to come together. But um, you know, my my uh, and of course becoming a nun became a lot less attractive. And this was a you know it was painful. And my mother it was a disappointment to your mother. She was it seemed a profound disappointment. That's mm -hmm. when I realized she'd taken me seriously. <laughs> but and I remembered. I mean, the, one of the worst moments was her catching me. You know, necking, which I'm not sure they use that phrase anymore. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, the, uh, with my boyfriend at 16 and just uh, like spitting the word, like it, it was a horrible moment. She, we thought, and we thought you were going to be a nun. And it was, uh, it was like a knife to my heart mm -hmm. because I suddenly felt after trying to be so much to my mother I, in that moment, I felt like I'd somehow completely betrayed her and also betrayed my divine destiny, which I still deep down thought was supposed to be some kind of sainthood or mm -hmm. you know something like that because it's it's kind of hard to compete with uh, an angel because that's essentially what you were kind of doing yeah. 
um, yeah. because during this time too, you had a journal, and I think you yeah. also spoke to the other Gayo. Well, um, it was it was it wasn't you know kind of audio speaking, but um, certainly in my early years, I there I made no distinction between. My, I felt like the continuation of the other Gayo. I call, would call her the other Gayo. So. She was me before the accident. I was her after the accident, mm -hmm. to put it that way. So we were continuous. It wasn't until I was about 12 years old that I started um, imagining her, and it was quite a shift, as a kind of a ghost who was uh, a year older than me, looked exactly like me, but she was a year older, and she was an inch taller. For some reason, that was important. And she lived under my bed. And I, so I, I thought about her a lot when I was away from the house that she was waiting for me. And I used to look through the Sears catalog for clothes. Dye. It was a secret. It was my secret. Mm -hmm. But at that point, I had clearly dis, uh, separated us somehow um, so that she was like a, my doppelganger. She was like a teenage ghost. And, um, and so I was no longer quite her. We were kind of coexisting, but in different dimensions. And, and, and she then, was there. She was there. And then gradually, yeah, I, some, you know, they, I went through different phases. There were other phases where I thought, I, th I imagined her to be a, um, well, an angel in heaven looking down on me. And mm -hmm. I used to, yeah, I used to, when, when, later in my teen years, my, my journal entries were all Dear Gail. And, and I, I felt, I was asked, I treated her like an agony aunt, what should I do, mm -hmm. you know? Why was it difficult for you to learn how to drive? Well, because I, yeah, because I felt that I'd been, I died in a car accident. So, yeah, I mean, um, it, it, uh, sometimes, I mean, my mother had presented it like a miracle. And this is very different from reincarnation. Mm -hmm. It's a miracle, it's like something, it doesn't just happen because of, you know, there's reincarnation exists. Is this one, that one person is going to be brought back to life, kind of like Lazarus. Mm -hmm. But, um, there was a point in my early 20s where I tried to think about it differently, and I tried to think about it as reincarnation, which seemed more neutral to me. It didn't seem like it had as much of a, a burden of obligation, you know, like mm -hmm. it's not my fault if I was reincarnated. Like that could happen to anyone, you know. There were, it was just a time when reincarnation was floating around Eastern ideas. So I, I felt more at that point that I must have been reincarnated. So there wasn't this, I didn't feel quite the same burden to be a saint at that point, but I did feel that I must have been hugely scarred by being in a hideous car accident and breaking my head against the dashboard. And so, yeah, so I would drive with one hand on the, you know, on whatever I could and I couldn't. Mm -hmm. It was a while before I could get my driver's license because I was so freaked out. And you had siblings. We've mentioned your yeah. sisters. Um, we actually have a picture of your mom with your two older mm. sisters. What did your sisters think of all this, <laughs> uh, Linda and Glenna? Yeah. Well, um, you know, I, I'm not sure in those early years whether they literally also thought I was the other Gail. I know they thought my mother, my mother thought it. But I think what they thought more than anything else mm -hmm. was that I was getting a completely disproportionate amount of my mother's attention. And uh, they, it wasn't clear to them how I deserved that. You know, my eldest sister, I think, still managed to hold it together because she was the eldest in the family. She's kind of, you know, my dad's firstborn. And, and she, was, tried to, she tried to be, you know, a well-behaved, perfect ch little adult child the way um, eldest children often mm -hmm. do. And so she, she kind of got by like that. But my sister, who was um, just a few years older than me, I think she was at that time, at the time just after the car accident, after my birth, she was the middle child. And I think she was neglected. And she was, you know, resentful. Mm -hmm. um, she was she she had uh, like a lot of imaginary friends to try to make up for it, I think. But uh, when she was a small child, she was pretty quirky, and um, and in her early years, I think she really quite resented me. And she was. I, th I find it so interesting that it was only later on that um, the conversation came up. <laughs> uh, why do you think that no one ever spoke yeah. about kind of like essentially the ghost in the room? Yeah. You know, I um, certainly. My, my mother gradually, she used to talk uh, about the accident, the death, and my birth to me as she, many times when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And I think 
it's at some point around, I think, I must have been when I was in, uh, it was somewhere between the ages, I would say, 6 and 12. You know, things, it gradually dropped right off. And she, I never talked about it with anyone else with, but her. She was the only one who raised it with me, and she started dropping right off, and then it just became this kind of secret history. Uh, why it happened, I think, I have ideas in retrospect. Mm -hmm. I think, in retrospect, I honestly believe that um, she had been in such an enormous pain that, that she couldn't stand it. I mean, I really think that she was in a kind of madness when I was born and convinced herself, or was convinced, mm -hmm. and with some reason to it, maybe that were, that I was, that her baby had been brought back to her. That means she never lost her baby after all. But in the meantime, though, you spent a lot of time trying to please your mother, mm -hmm. um, and you suffered anxiety that you learned to cover up. Um, how much of this, uh, you know, trying to please her, the expectations, how much of that was your mother, and how much of it was the pressure that you put on yourself? Yeah. Well, you know, that I felt that it, I, I felt that I had to be that way. I had to excel. You know, I, I, if, if you'd asked me at the age of, you know, 18, why I felt like uh, that I, I had to be such a way, or, or even at the age of 12, or at the age of 25, why it was so important to me to get like straight A's, or to, and it, or I mean, because by then it had converted from being a saint to being a scholar. Mm -hmm. You know, I was trying to take go that route, which also seemed to impress my mother. So. Um, I just, I, you know, I wasn't very self-critical at the time. In retrospect, and gradually, I, I realized that I, I blamed her, mm -hmm. that, that I felt that it was the pressure she had put on me because I was feeling I had to live up to some expectation, to, you know, because of this substitution, I felt that I'd been forced to try to make up for or, or somehow reverse this horrible pain that had happened to her. Mm -hmm. But then gradually, I blamed myself because finally, um, I wanted to be that special person for her. But you were so hard on yourself. <laughs> well, I think people are, yeah. So. Um, we have a, a picture of you and your dad at a father-daughter dance. Um, <laughs> what was your relationship with your father like? Yeah. Well, he, my dad was quite um, very reserved and kind of absent going through a lot of um, our childhood and teen years in the sense that he was like working six hour days. We ended up in a family of seven children mm -hmm. and um, he, he worked, you know, had a kind of grueling um, work life all through that time. And, and my mother completely dominated the family. Um, she was quite a disciplinarian. She was the boss of the family, hands down. She kept everyone, she was very, very moralistic. And mm -hmm. my dad was a, a kind of a weekend drinker. And that was, uh, so he was in the doghouse uh, every weekend and uh, I guess trying to make up for it through the week. Mm -hmm. um, and we, I embraced that imp image that, of my dad that he was a week, week, you know. I think we had this sense that, because my mother had been educated in a, a convent, a residential convent school run by nuns because her mother died at a young age and she was put in this residential convent school. By her dad? Yes. Mm -hmm. and. Um, we were, I was just internalized this idea that women have to be the strong ones mm -hmm. and that men have these weaknesses like drink, et cetera. Do you think your dad resented your mother? I think he resented um, naturally how hard he had to work, um, you know, because of uh, all these kids and he was the, the, the sole bread earner and that, and he was so stressed out in that and he would, he, would like to have been able to have a bunch of beers on the weekend and he couldn't do it without quite a lot of grief. And uh, he resented that, yeah, and I think it made him drink more, actually, I drink. <laughs> but how, what my relationship was with my dad during a time, not very good, mm -hmm. no. Um, well, you write in the book, uh, my life had been marked by fear of risk, fear of chaos, fear of being different. What role has fear played in your life? Um, Hmm. Uh, he, just huge. Isn't it sad to say? Mm -hmm. You know, because um, uh, I would say that I I was fearful from like from my 
from some of my earliest memories, fearful that I was going to die again, <laughs> for one thing, you know, which is silly. You, I, you would think maybe that I uh, would have been fearful that, uh, that I would have been felt stronger because I died and come back to life. No, it was somehow the opposite. Mm -hmm. And I had a real a vivid imagination for horrors, um, you know, things like war, and, like, I mean, things happening around the world. And I, you know, I, had, I had this very strong sense of uh, di disaster. So there was that. But I was also just so fearful that I was going to let my mother down. I mean, I don't know, you know what was worse. Was the idea I was going to let God down, I was going to let my mother down. I'm not sure I would have been able to figure mm -hmm. out the difference between those two fears. You had this really, I guess, pivotal conversation with your mother. Uh, she became ill, and before mm -hmm. she died, you, uh, the two of you went on a walk. Mm -hmm. What did your mother say to you on that walk? She told me a story I'd never heard before, because I'd heard very little about her mother, because her mother died when she was eight years old. She said, she, she told me this story about in the middle of the, you know, the depression. They were very poor, rural poverty in, in Prince Edward Island. And they were, her mother had eight children. She was the second youngest and the only girl. And she was managing to feed the family from their own garden. And it was s scraping, you know, all the time just to have enough food. And um, her, her father, she talked about how her father, how f afraid everyone in the family was of the father. He was so, um, he was very domineering. He was hard drinking. He was six foot four and very kind of um, physically dominant. And he, uh, it was towards dinner time, and she'd laid out plates for the entire family food on, on the table for dinner. And um, her husband, my mother's dad, got home uh, in a terrible mood, terrible fit, because he'd, he, he was angry at two of the boys and had um, yelling at them. And, um, he took hold of the table that was completely set with all the plates, with all the food for the dinner, and he just flipped it. And she was telling me this. So she was so far advanced in her cancer that she could barely walk, but she somehow wanted to tell me this. She said her memory was of the food and plates flying everywhere, crashing down, and her mother, like this horrible kind of cry out, and then fall on her knees start slowly scraping the food off the floor and off the broken plates, just desperately trying to salvage the meal, not saying a word. And my mother just said, I, I remembered such anger at my mother that she never opened her mouth. But she realized her mother was afraid. And she said, um, my father loved us, but he tried to control us with his anger. He And uh, she said, and I've realized through my life I've done that too. and." Uh, and I realized that uh, often it makes everything worse. You know? And I, she didn't literally say, I'm sorry, I tried to control you and, and my other children the way I did. She didn't have to say that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that's what she was saying. And she also said she loved you for the first time? Yeah. Well, we both, I actually don't remember who said it first. Mm -hmm. But I mean, yeah, for when she was dying, and by this time I was in my early 40s, um, and we, yeah, we were saying that we loved each other for the first time. It was, it was very powerful. I think that, and I think there were other members of the family who felt the same way, closer to her for the very first time. And um, yeah, so the timing was good for that. Mm -hmm. because, yeah. We've run out of time, Gail. <laughs> um, your writing is so beautiful, oh, and uh, what a story. Thank you so much for being brave enough to write this. Uh, we appreciate your time. Oh, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.